Well, I know I say this with every guest I have on that that I'm super excited to have them on the show because I generally uh, do love all the guests that I have on here. This one is no different. Rodden Satamassimo is a uh, commercial real estate coach and author uh, in the U.S., trains, coaches, people all over North America and the world. Uh, I've read two of his books. The third one's on my uh, wish list. And I'm just a big fan of Rod's, Rod's in general. So I'm excited to, to get into this. This interview will be more geared towards brokers, uh, particularly new brokers into the field. That's that's what I talked to him in advance about the topic that we're going to have. I think even if you're related uh, in, in a business related field or you're an experienced uh, commercial real estate agent, I think you'll still get some value from this. Uh, and I'm going to jump right into this with uh, one that I'm very excited to uh, to get going. So let's jump into it. Well, thanks so much for uh, joining me on this call, Rod. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it, Chad. I'm looking forward to our time together. Yeah, likewise. And as I mentioned to you uh, in the pre-chat there, I've, I've read two of your books. The third one's on my list of things to do. So I've been a fan of yours uh, from when you did Brokers Who Dominate to the, the Teams Built to Dominate. I've read both of those books and thoroughly enjoyed them. So I'm excited to, to get your uh, thoughts and opinions uh, just on the commercial real estate brokerage model and agents in general. So I, you've got a ton of wisdom to offer. I just really want to jump right into this with uh, with a hard hitting question. What's What are what are the best traits of top producing agents that you've seen along your career? Yeah, well, the traits, the traits itself really haven't changed since I wrote that first book, Brokers Who Dominate, The Eight Traits of Top Producers. Those, those haven't changed. Being disciplined, oriented to the client, having market presence, right? Industry focus, that's really important. You know, navigating the career, being assertive, team oriented more than any other time, and entrepreneurial. But that that has not changed but the way we apply those traits today especially in a you know i used to say post pandemic but unfortunately i can't say post pandemic anymore but in this pandemic laden uh society that we're in how we apply those traits have absolutely changed so can you expand on that a little bit more sure i i think you know i wrote a white paper um recently we're actually putting it out I think in two weeks on these six post pandemic um, prospecting playbook, I think it was called the post post pandemic prospecting playbook, the six trends that really impacted that have happened since the pandemic. Now I can't say post pandemic, but it's true when the pandemic uh, hits and the way we prospect, the way we produce, the way we, we create business today has changed. And like everyone, everyone has said, uh, Chad, is that the the acceleration, not only of technology, but of methodology and just a pure application of what we do, has been incredible, right? So now, of course, this is common. Zoom is commonplace today. You know, back even people forget that in March of 2020, oh, a Zoom call, but now it's like, okay, we're going to Zoom it. it. That's obvious, right? But also now, look, I could take this and I could do a, a Zoom prospecting text message. I could do a video text message. I could do a bomb bomb, a vidyard to go sequentially in my prospecting with an email, a text, a call, a voicemail, a LinkedIn dropped, a, a, dare I say, TikTok. You know, prospecting sequencing has now become the new prospecting cadence. So just that alone has had a significant difference. Now, this is so new, brokers haven't figured it out yet. They're doing mostly cadence, call frequency, and now they're just starting to think sequencing, because sequencing campaigns, the, the pandemic has caused us all to think sequencing. That's just one of several aspects that now we need to adapt. Great point. And, and from the prospecting angle, I, the trainers that I've had in the past uh, have always focused on on prospecting as being such an integral tool. And I know you're more from the coaching standpoint, from the training standpoint. So uh, my next question leads in is in prospecting, but perhaps you could differentiate between coaching and training just so that we clarify what that is. Sure. Both both are I find both valuable. I do. And yes, I am biased to coaching. There's no doubt about it. And, and training in its definition is the, is the, um, the transition of 
and the, and the transportation of information, right? Mm-hmm. Hey, here's the information. I'm going to tell you what it is. Now, good luck, right? That's really what it is. So read a book. I write books. Books are information. My last book, Knowing Isn't Doing. Well, because of the title, it's obvious, right? You have to go ahead and read the book. In fact, in my last book, I basically gave away a lot of our Mosmo methodology. And my entire sales team said, Rod, we're going to go out of business. Look what you just did. I said, just wait and see. <laughs> because now sales are booming because knowing isn't doing. That's training. Training is just the transportation of information. Here's information. Good luck. Coaching, though, is the true transformation itself. And that is the implementation, the application, the accountability. So we're going to give you the information, yes. But we're going to make sure then you apply it and implement it. And if it doesn't work, we're going to retest. Where does it work? Refine. Here's how it works. What works for you, your natural behavior is where it is. And so then it starts to work. You know, we can all think about the coaches that we worked with, those we enjoyed and those we didn't, and where they helped us and how they helped us. Because they worked with us on whatever it was, holding a baseball bat, uh, swinging a golf club, learning math, right? Coaching is more transformation, and it's the transformation that creates the greatest results. So that's that I find to be the difference. Yeah, that's really well said. And anecdotally for myself, I know there is a big difference between reading about something from a theoretical standpoint and then actually going out and doing it and getting personalized instruction on it. So I, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate of that as well. And, and I think to your earlier point, there's a time and place for both. So it's, uh, I, I think both are useful and, and your books are a good example of that training standpoint. Uh, on, on the prospecting one, because I really want to dig into that a little bit more, whether you're writing a, a about it in a book or whether you're coaching someone, how fundamental is the prospecting element to a broker's success? Uh, <laughs> it's everything. I mean, it, it truly is. If you can't originate business on your own, and that's okay if your natural behavior is say you're more of a fulfiller, right? Mm-hmm. You, someone can find it, originate it, win it, and but someone needs to service it, then maybe you're a great cog in that team to go ahead and and fulfill it. So from a brokerage success standpoint, Maybe you don't need to originate, but someone's got to. Someone's got to find the business. And we work some of the greatest uh, corporate services team that the corporation goes out and finds the big corporate deals. And then they have a service team that fulfills it. They're not really originating business. A major, you know, major firms or major companies, but the firm's finding the business. So prospecting is everything. And let me just be clear here. We talk about sequencing. We talk about digital media. We talk about video text. We, we track everything, everything chat at Massimo and this is the way we do it. So I have 13 years of tracking thousands of brokers and not just brokers, but mortgage brokers, mortgage bankers, now appraisers, engineers, and how even investors we're now working with and seeing how they get their business. The number one source every year is the phone. So how important is it? (laughs) <laughs> it is vital to your success. So let's let's elaborate on that because I, I agree with you. I've been doing this for 16 years. And so I, I got into the business before social media started proliferating uh, when the phone was really the only way that you could be uh, prospecting. But as social media has come in, that, that almost seems to be a crutch that a lot of new agents almost rely on as if they think that it's as productive as some of the older school methods And I've noticed the same thing. There's nothing that replaces the phone from a technology standpoint. They all have their purpose. I I think that they're valuable in their own unique sense, but it's just not as productive or as efficient. So when you're coaching or advising somebody, uh, and and this could be the full spectrum, this could be from prospecting a a small tenant to go into a small listing that they have all the way up to like a corporate services group that you have. What, What advice are you giving to people to ensure that they're, maximizing their time prospecting from using the phone well again prospecting prospecting is best positioned when there's a leverage of presence we talked about you asked me about that social media so uh, you know we i think i wrote about this i think in my first book maybe in my second book but definitely my third book at the mosmo group we have this element called the p factor p plus p plus p equals p cubed P cubed because there is an exponential effect. I understand mathematically it doesn't work, but but it truly works 
an exponential. So the first P is your value proposition. I have an audience. I have a message. This is a message for that audience. Let's, so Chad, tell, tell me what you do. What do you do? A uh, commercial real estate broker. I help clients. No, but, but for what? For whom? Who's your Who's your target audience? Uh, I'm prim primarily small local companies based in my market. Uh, lease, sales, office, multifamily. Uh, what do you do? Industrial sales and leasing. Industrial sales and leasing. So you have a value proposition for the private industrial user in regards to their leasing or their selling of their space. Is that is that correct? Yes. Okay. So let's just start throw a message out there right now. Let's create one for you. Okay. So the message is that you're gonna pick up the phone and say, Hi, this is and I hope it is, is it Griffins or Griffiths? I got the I got the which one is it? Griffiths. Griffiths. I I, I believe it or not. I have a, my chief marketing officer, his last name is Griffiths. That's when I get it right. So, <laughs> so, hello, this is Chad Griffiths from ABC Company. The reason I'm calling is because I'd like to meet with you because many of the industrial users I'm working with right now are based on facing three challenges on their space. We've identified two solutions that have maximized their, whatever, cash flow in regards to their real estate needs. I would like 15 minutes of your time next week to share exactly what your peers are doing in this rather disruptive market. Boom. Okay, you have a value proposition that grabs their attention that they say, yeah, right? Because Chad, I can guarantee you, we won't do it right now, but you know those three challenges that industrial users are facing today in your specific market with your politics and your economics and your logistics and everything else that's going on, you know, right? I don't know, but you know. That's a value proposition, first P. Second P in this order, right, it's gotta be in this order is, now, with the value proposition I have, I could take that and I could start a presence campaign. I could take that messaging and I could put that on social media. I could put that out on, um, on some postcards. I could maybe write a letter about it. I could do some, all these personal, physical, digital things I could do and start having this, by the way, this is one of the six trends, having this omnipresence that I'm everywhere. And everyone sees Chad on this, and, and Chad is the industrial expert and knows everything about these six trends. And they all relate to me. And I think he, or Chad gets me, Chad understands me. So now the third P is the prospect sequencing. And now Chad calls me up and asks me for business. And because he has a real valuable message, that, that value proposition, he has a presence. I've seen him, I've heard of him. I'm comfortable with him. Maybe I know him, maybe I trust him. And now he calls me or he contacts me or he texts me or he video chats me. I'm going, man, I'm good. I feel good. I'm not going to say no. Chances are much higher. When so in that order, so I'm trying in, in a very long answer to your question, prospecting is always a valuable component because if all you rely on is saying, hey, Rod, I blog everywhere. I post everywhere. Rod, I'm famous. Why aren't they calling me? Because Chad, that's not how it works. <laughs> you got to pick up the phone and you have to ask for the business. You have to, you have to. Now I'll, I'll continue this conversation. I, I know I'm probably going too long because I host my own podcast. Oh, I love I, it. Keep going. Keep and, going. And I hate my guests do this. <laughs> but Chad, here's the thing. Um, so for example, there, there was a list, there's lists that come out and then all these people put these lists together and I'm, I, I'm, I'm on some of them and I, I will first admit I'm pretty, I'm like, oh, I'm on the list, right? And so the list was top influencers on LinkedIn. Top 110 influencers on LinkedIn. A number, a number 18, by the way, for what matters. So anyway, so what, I, what I just said to you, a number 18, by the way, that was a total vanity position, right? So I'm out there, I'm on a list. So maybe there's number one, you know, whoever that person is, fantastic. And there's number 110, fantastic. But those people are known to being influencers on digital media. It doesn't mean they are significantly high producers, right? It has nothing to do. And that's what I think sometimes the brokerage community correlates the two. And as, a, as someone who's, who's worked in these communities for 13 years and knows a lot of brokers, a lot of people on those lists are really, really strong producers. We work with a lot of people on those lists. And they're fantastic brokers. And a lot of people on those lists, they're not. It's just, you just gotta understand that. But my point is this, presence in its own right, by definition, is a vanity play. It is, right? Look at me, get my message, get my brand. Prospecting, by definition, is a sanity play. 
What's in my bank account? What's in my pipeline? How can I fill it? So while some of you out there right now are thinking, well, all I could do is be famous. Okay. But fame is in fortune, not in commercial real estate, at least. We're not Hollywood stars. We're not. We're just not. In fact, if I think if you asked you, think of your 10 most famous real estate people, it doesn't mean that the 10 best off. You may think they are. doesn't mean they are. In fact, it may be the quietest guy in the room who's making the millions of dollars and just he's prospecting, has his clients, it's a full pipeline, consistent pipeline, and he's just chopping away every day. You don't know. Yeah, that's so well said because I can speak to that from my own experience as well. For uh, We stopped blogging about a year ago, but there was a five-year stretch where I blogged every single week, writing about local issues or taxes or big concerns like you're talking about. I, I spent a considerable amount of time writing these blog articles, and I can count on one hand, after five years of writing a blog every single week, I can count on one hand how many times a big client had actually reached out to me. And that was every single week, like 250 blog uh, articles. So you're right. I, I love that point is that if you even if you do have this cachet of, of being like an, a recognized expert and people know that, that's not enough for them to pick up a phone and call you. But I love the point you made that if they know about you and you call them, they're a lot, a lot more receptive uh, to, to pick up that call. I, I think that that's a, that's a phenomenal point to make on that. When, so so I, I guess, how do you prioritize what an agent would need to do then? Because for some someone like myself, who's been doing it for a while, who has a bit of a reputation in my market, that's easier for me to call someone and the expectation that they might know who I am versus someone that's coming into the market or, or even an experienced agent who hasn't done any of this stuff, if they don't have that, that name brand familiarity, what, what do you recommend first? Is it still just get onto a prospecting sequence or is it try to develop your brand simultaneously? Go back to my P factor, right? Cause it, cause it works. The very first thing you've got to have is a target audience with a targeted message. Cause even if you don't have a presence, you know, if your message resonates, this is Chad Griffiths from ABC Company. The reason I'm calling is because there are three specific things happening through industrial owners just like you that are impacting their cash flow today and whatever it might be, right? That's going to resonate. That's, in fact, going to take over and overshadow any most of the presence you don't have because, ooh, he gets me. He's talking about me. So don't worry about the presence. You don't have it yet. Don't worry about it. Figure out the messaging that's going to resonate with that avatar. It's just the way it, you have, that's the most important thing. That's why it's first. That's why it's first in the P factor. There's, there's a, there's, it's not a random order. Just go, and, and, and when you're saying, you're, somebody's saying, Rod, how do you know this is important? I know it's important because I've coached thousands of your peers, number one. And those that, that follow this, this factor, we call it the P factor, they just tend to make the most money, which is fine. Don't get me wrong. But they also have the most margin in their lives, which means they make a lot of money, but they have a lot of time to, to do what they want with that money. That's what it means. So focus on who you're going to call and what their challenges are, and then you'll know what to say. If you can get that down, you're good. Yeah, and, and to your point as well, you you truly have coached some of the best uh, and most successful brokers. There's even two guys in my market, uh, Corey Wozniak and Mark Hardum, uh, top office guys. And not only are they some of the top office guys in their office, they're some of the top office guys in the whole industry. So uh, that was I, th I think you had that one in the teams built to dominate. You profiled those two guys. And that was a, that was a fascinating chapter, particularly because I know them and, and they're just really good guys. Uh, but I, I agree with you. This isn't just like that theoretical standpoint of, of saying this might work if you do it. We read about it in a textbook, so we believe it'll work. It, it is true. It is it is definably true that what you're saying is being implemented by some of the top agents and teams all over the world. Uh, so I, I guess on that point, and, and, and I've noticed this with some of the newer brokers coming in, is that not, not all brokers, especially some of the newer ones, are as driven to be top per performing brokers. I've, heard, I've just heard from a lot of newer, younger brokers that lifestyle is really important. Uh, they want to go into a place where they don't need to be the top producer. They want to make a good living. I think that that's a commonality across all generations. They want to make a good living. But some of them would, would put lifestyle over that achievement goal of being top producers. So what, do you, what are you saying to younger brokers that, that have different goals and don't necessarily want to be top producers? 
Oh, oh, no one. Look, that's why we we are at our motto at, at Mosmo Group is build the business and life that you desire. I, I don't I don't define what you want to achieve. That's up to you, right? But if you want to achieve this, then let's go get it, right? If you want to achieve a hundred thousand dollars a year, and you're only making fifty, let's go get it, right? If you want to achieve five hundred, you're making two hundred. Let's go get it. You know, if you want to achieve five million, you're making a hundred. Let's get real. <laughs> it's what it is, right? So no, we don't. We don't just work with top producers. People def define their own goals, and we help them get there. So, but this is what I would say to anyone, anyone, regardless of that. Look, if you are a commercial real estate broker, and that's the audience here, you have to admit this one thing. You just have to, that you elected, and it was an election. It wasn't forced upon you unless your parents or someone said, you're going to do this, right? You elected that commercial real estate is going to be the vehicle of which will take you to your desired destination. That's, you make that election. Whether that be, you know, a certain standard of living or a certain margin of your life, you elected that to be the vehicle. So if you made that election and you have that, that destination in mind, then you better leverage commercial real estate for all it's worth to get to that destination. Because, example, the other day we were talking to somebody and – you know, it's shocking. I have a team, a whole team of salespeople now. It's just amazing the evolution of Mossimo Group since I started by myself. But I was told by a sales guy uh, that some guy wants to work 30 hours a week. I was like, okay, that's, 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 a, I haven't heard that in a while. I haven't. He must make 30 hours a week and make $200,000 a year. I was like, well, that, you know, if he's in the right market, that will work. If he's in Southern California, New York, that'd be a really problem. He won't make all, because not a lot of money in those markets. But, okay. So my point was, then let's figure out how to get him there. If that's what he wants, let's figure it out. That's what he wants. So everyone, everyone, Chad, that's up to them. That's up to them. You don't have to, but you've got to understand commercial real estate is a vehicle to get your destination. And if it is, I, I always challenge people, then let's make the most out of this ride. Let's see how much we can, we can really leverage this thing called commercial real estate, brokerage in your case, and how much we can squeeze from this. What is it going to be? Uh, that's a wonderful answer. And, and I love that perspective on it because it, it doesn't necessarily need to be this thing where people have to come in and work 80 hours a week. They can, and there's usually the results that are, uh, that are reflective of that, but there is the ability 30 hours might be pretty light as well. I don't know anyone that's, uh, that's made 200 grand a year consistently working 30 hours. Plus maybe what, like some of the older guys might be able to do it, but there's not many younger, younger guys that can. I, I, I and the reason that, that I'm trying to focus on, on the younger guys is that I know that a, a lot of my audience are people that, that are either new into the business or they're considering getting into commercial real estate. So I, I, I really want to focus on that segment of it, uh, especially on YouTube. I think YouTube just by general is going to be more of that younger demographic. Uh, and, and I can tell that just from the people that have reached out to me over, over the last year or so. So I, I guess the final question I'd ask for you, and, and it's final, but that by no means is it less important than the other points that you brought up. But if you were advising a new agent, and typically they're not going to be in a position where they can even afford coaching, they can't afford training, they're probably just trying to get their feet wet and figure out how the business even works. Do you have any general advice you'd give to someone new into the industry and what they should be doing in their first couple of years in the business? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first and foremost, I, to, I have to share that we do have a new to business coaching program that okay. we've, we, we've had for a couple of years now. And we have many, many people in that program, and it's a blast. But So if you're new to business, come check us out. But look, find a mentor, find a senior. That's, you, you may not make some money, but there's ways definitely to leverage a senior or mentor so you can start filling your pipeline right away. Number one, do that. Number two, become the smartest person in the room. There's nothing – I wrote about this in my first book, uh, Jason Little – First year in the business, exactly what he did. He just went to his mentor. It was a funny the way, if you remember, I don't know if you remember this, he was selling suits and he found a guy that was always bought the nicest suit. He said, what do you do? I'm a broker. Let me work with you. He begged him and begged him. And finally, the broker said, okay, come work with me. And he said, you know, tell me about your clients. And then he chased the, that senior broker's inactive clients, right? Clients he worked with in the past. And he said, you know, let me help, let me help, let me help. And he started building a business. You all could do that. 
you can work with a senior and say, there's no doubt there are people you work with in the past that you've let through the cracks. Let me reinvigorate that relationship. Let me get back those deals. You get them. Give me a piece of the action. Believe me, it works. This, this approach absolutely works. Then become a smart, read the co-star reports, read the market reports, become a student of the game. Just don't be a passive spectator to your vocation. That'd be a big mistake, right? The ones that make the most of their first few years are the ones that really understand the craft of commercial real estate. They just do. Yes, read books, but then apply the books, right? Knowing isn't doing. Read the book, apply the book. Read the book, make notes in the margins. There's some really great books out there if you're just starting out. If you're just starting out, you do investment sales. I mean, there's some really, really good books out there. One of my favorite investment book sales is by Brad Umansky. He wrote a book called Value At It. It goes step by step on how to do an investment deal um, if you're in investment sales. Um, there was an older book called The Tenant's Handbook. I think it's out of print if you did leasing, but unfortunately, I think that's out of print. Brokers Who Dominate still sells every day 10, 10 years later. In fact, Chad, we're going to do a Brokers Who Dominate Revisit It project starting next month. It's been 10 years now. I can't believe it. But that book still sells like crazy. So, yeah, become a student of the game, grab that mentor, grab that senior, and say, look, how can I help? How can I help? And the last thing I'll leave you with is don't forget, everyone, Chad, senior, mid-career, there's always two things that everyone wants. And this is the case in real estate. This is the case in life. There are two things that everyone wants, and that is, how do I increase my income? It's true. Even tenants will increase their income, increase the cash flow by reducing their rent. So how do I increase my income, but also, how do I increase my outcomes? One's empirical, one's explicit, but they got to achieve both. If you remember that, you're going to start filling your pipeline. So there you go. Yeah, that's that's some fantastic words of wisdom. I, I I really do appreciate that, and I didn't know about that new uh, boot camp that you had for agents. So I'll I'll put a link to that uh, in the description. I'll I'll look for it on your website. If I don't find it, I'll send you a quick note on that. Uh, and then I'll also link to the Massimo Group, uh, you as well on LinkedIn. Any other ways that that people can get in touch with you if they wanted to reach out? Uh, just Massimo-Group.com, Massimo-Group.com, M-A-S-S-I-M-O. Or if you want, check out my new book, KnowingIsn'tDoing.com. Chad, it was actually the number one sales book in the country when we launched it last year. So it hit a nerve. I don't know how, but it hit a nerve. So well, hey, Chad, I, I, but, go ahead. I, I could see how. I mean, I, I think people will just be able to see your energy and your passion and your zest for wanting to give value. So I can completely understand why that was a bestseller. Well, Chad, you are, you're the man, and I greatly appreciate it. I'm honored to have the, uh, spend some time with you, buddy. Likewise, Rod. I really do appreciate your time, and uh, I'll leave links for all that in the description. Thanks again, Rod. Really do appreciate it. Take care. Hey, thanks, Rod. As you can see, Rod is just a super passionate and knowledgeable guy. Uh, I loved everything that he talked about on there. I thought he had a lot of great wisdom. Uh, I'll put links to everything in the description on what he talked about and encourage you to, uh, to visit their website and look at their coaching and uh, also check out his books. And uh, thank you for watching. Uh, please consider subscribing. I'll catch you in the next video. Thanks.